world peace a certainty and surely as we you know we come to the end of this year we look forward to a, another year it's very a very poignant subject isn't it world peace and for me to say world peace a certainty well um uh, john um said it was a bold statement it is a bold statement isn't it you might say it's an outrageous statement you might say it's an impossible statement but surely it's a desirable statement it's something that we all would wish for isn't it but how can it possibly happen how could how can we say world peace is a certainty well i'm not saying that world peace will necessarily um ensue immediately um in 2024 we don't really know when, but what I'm saying is world peace is a, is, is a certainty, according to the Bible. Now, the world seems a very dangerous place, doesn't it, at the moment? There's no sign of peace on a, a local level or a global level. Um, if you cast your minds back to the early days of the pandemic, um, there seemed to be um, a fair bit of goodwill in a way, wasn't there? You remember those early days and we were kind of all in it together there was this pandemic and we all got to save the nhs and we've all got to kind of work together to try and find what, what was the the answer to this virus you know is there going to be an injection we can all have that's going to cure us um what how are we going to deal with it and there was a sentiment wasn't there, that we're all in this together but you know that soon degenerated didn't they Be didn't they because we were very competitive are we nations were competing with each other and then, as we started to come out of the pandemic, we, we you know, we found this wonderful, these wonderful vaccines, etc. Um, we said, let's build back better, and there seemed to be like, yeah, let's, you know, we're going to make make the world better. And, and but this doesn't seem to have been realised, does it? And I don't know about you, but I find on a on a local level, um, people emerge from the lockdowns kind of angrier um, than they went in. Uh, that sort of feeling of, of goodwill and, and working together uh, soon evaporated and there's an air isn't there of anxiety uh, and dissatisfaction through you know through this country and throughout the world and there's no sign of war and conflict ending so there's many many um causes and, and 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 problems in this world um that are leading to a, a position where we we don't have world peace at the moment aren't there um I, I did this talk about three months ago i did it in october um and at that point um people were looking at the russia ukraine situation and saying will it end soon <coughs> well there doesn't seem to be any sign of that ending does there? that that, that conflict is is still going on still raging um, it kind of went off the uh, off the radar a little bit for a bit, didn't it? When the Israel Gaza thing kicked off, and we didn't hear quite so much about it, but um, it's, it, it seems to have um, peaked a little bit more just recently. But there's, there's these they're, they're sort of major conflicts that, that we are, that we sort of look at and we pay attention to. Um, but there's loads more conflicts, as we know, going on all around the world. Some of the problems that we have are, are caused by climate change. Um, and different countries are competing with each other for resources. And so we have conflicts over, over things like water and um, food, food security and, and all these sorts of things. Really, there's enough um, food in the world, I, I would suggest, that we could feed everybody, but because of the way, because of human nature, um, we, we're not making the most of that. Um, we, we're just in this cycle of conflict. Um, many African countries are, are war-torn. The terrible famines and and uh, things going on over there, and so we have these um, people arriving in, risking their lives to come to Europe and to and to our country um, in search of refuge um, in in boats um, and, and and other dangerous ways of of coming, because their countries are are, are in a terrible state and they are they're in uh, states of persecution. We have uh, culture wars going on. People from the are arguing from the, the uh, a lefty, as we might say, perspective, and people from a, a right wing sort of perspective 
are all arguing about how um, how we should um, conduct ourselves. What's the best ide ideology? And uh, and these these things are, are raging away on our social media and um, on our uh, our news networks, and uh, quite distressing really and uh, unsettling and, and and quite aggressive the way people become people who might seem quite quite nice um, can become very exercised, can't they? And, and angry and, 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 and conflict develops from this. Um, yeah, the day that I gave this talk um, a few months ago, uh, this had happened. Israel, we, we read, had been bombarded and, and it was the day that all those um, atrocities occurred um, in Israel, which then led to the, the Gaza um, situation. And, uh, and, and that doesn't seem to have any sign of, of, of ending, does it, so any time soon? It's a very, very distressing situation for all those involved on, on both sides of the, of the conflict. And, um, you know, we do live in a, very, in a very dangerous time. So how can I say that world peace is, is a certainty? Well, I'm looking at it from a Bible perspective. And you might say to me, well, Paul, religion... That, that's one of the biggest problems. That's the cause of, of, of wars. And I can't deny that because people do um, have strong views on religion and they will use um, force to pursue their, 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 their goals. They, they, they think they've got a, you know, a righteous anger or whatever. That's not the way the Bible teaches us that we should um, conduct ourselves. The Bible talks about peace. It doesn't talk about war. But people will use religion um, to uh, to conduct wars and, and, and whip up people into uh, following um, these things and, and and doing pretty awful things, as we know from the, some of the terrorist events that we see around. But the Bible sets out a vision for world peace, where conflict is a thing of the past. So I'd like to share with you some of the the. the um, the vision, if you like, that the Bible um, portrays, um, first of all. But before that, I just want to say why I trust in the Bible. Um, because obviously I'm saying world peace is a certainty. So I've got to have a, a sort of a foundation for that. And, and it's the Bible, really, that's my foundation. Um, the Bible is, um, I believe, um, the word of God. And God is our creator. He created you. He created me. He created all of this world. And whether we look on a, um, uh, on a, on a grand scale at the things in creation, um, you know, from, I don't know, I mean, I work closely with nature. And I observe the design in nature all the time. And I can see the hand of God or hand of a, a creator, if you want to um, take it to that level. Uh, a designer in, in all of it from the great grandest things to the smallest there's a, a picture on your screen there on the top right hand corner um, of the uh, flagellum um, it's, it's a bacterial flagellum and it's basically sh it's showing the uh, we call it reducible irreducible complexity and it's basically showing this little small motor that um, tr helps transport these tiny bacteria around from one part of, of, of a, a system to, to another. And the design um, is, is, is incredible when you, you look at it. And none of these parts have any purpose or can, func or can function without um, the, the other parts being there. So it, it kind of speaks of a designer. And you can see that you can, you know, in all the different parts of our, our bodies, you know, the heart, um, all, all these things. There's no purpose to them without the rest of the parts but this is going down to the very tiniest tiniest um, super um, <coughs> microscopic level um, so that's just one example I'm not, I'm not going to talk all about this because it's another subject in itself I'm just trying to say why the Bible is, is something we can trust in um, another reason and again we could have a whole subject uh, lecture on this but it's um, archaeology so we've got there on the left hand um, top corner a picture of uh, the city of Babylon as, as, a, as an artist's impression really but um, Babylon was a city which uh, until 
few hundred years ago, um, quite recent history, um, people believe, well, it, it just didn't, it didn't exist. There wasn't a sign, any sign of it at all. The Bible talked about it a lot. And critics of the Bible would say, well, where is this city? You know, it's, 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 it's made up, it doesn't exist. But the archaeologists um, discovered it. And you can go down to the um, British Museum and you can see some of the artefacts from, um, from Babylon. Uh, you've got that big blue building is the Ishtar Gate, I believe, and, and they've got like a, a mock-up of that and some of the actual parts of it in the, in the British Museum. So you can go down there, you can see that, and, and lots of other artefacts um, that um, prove the accuracy of the Bible, that it is a, a true record. Um, so so there's, there's all of these things. And then there is um, prophecy. So the bottom right-hand corner there, it's a little bit blurry, I think, from perhaps from uh, where you are. But um, we've got there uh, an image, like a big statue, um, and he's kind of being, he's sort of falling backwards, isn't he? Um, but that was a um, that was a, an image or a statue that um, the great king of Babylon actually dreamt about, um, and he dreamt about this great image with a head of gold, shoulders and arms of silver, thighs and belly of brass, and legs of iron. And, and certain things occur to it. But in, in the scripture, it actually tells us what they were, and it tells us that they were to be um, kingdoms or empires that would come. The Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire. And these things came to pass exactly as, as, as they said they would. So, uh, and there's loads more prophecy that we could um, you know, uh, talk about and, and show you, but we don't have time. The Dead Sea Scrolls uh, are, are a wonderful example too, um, showing the accuracy of the word. So the, the, the Bible, um, the, the oldest record we had um, of the, the scriptures, the old, oldest documents, were about a thousand years old um, until 19, 1967 when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. And they found that these were um, exactly um, accurate um, f from 2,000 years ago to 1,000 years ago. So th th nothing had changed. And there's lots of reasons why we can see that th this Bible this is, is accurate. It's an accurate word. So lots of reasons to trust the Bible. So that's my foundation for why um, I, th I think these things are certain. So looking at Israel now, um, and Israel in, in prophecy... Uh, they would prophesy that they would uh, return to their, their land, and, and, and they did do. But looking at Israel now, it would seem unlikely that that very land will one day become the centre of a worldwide kingdom, doesn't it? From which the world will be ru ru ruled in peace. It's not a peaceful place at the moment. And yet ex that's exactly what the Bible tells us will happen. So let's have a look at a few passages. I'll start with the first one that we read together, um, Isaiah chapter 2, and just un unpack that a little bit. So this is a, a future um, prophecy. And I'll say, we, these prophecies, uh, so many of them have already come true, but this is a future one, where we read, that this, this is the word um, that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days. So it, it's describing a time still to come, a future time, the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills. So he's talking about um, the, the, a temple, if you like, that's going to be built on top of a high mountain. And we see that it's concerning Judah and Jerusalem. That was the first verse. So it's, it's going to be in Jerusalem. And all nations shall flow to it. So it's talking about all nations coming there. So that's Britain, isn't it? All nations. That's France. That's America. That's Russia. Um, that's Ukraine. That's um, the Palestinians. That's the Jews. All nations flowing unto it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. So they're going to learn something about God and we will walk in his path so they're going to 
uh, take a different direction from the path they're on now, where we have all this conflict and um, all the problems that we've already discussed. They're going on a different path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall rebuke many people. So he's going to judge between these nations. And what's the outcome of all this? They're going to beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's world peace. That is world peace, isn't it? Because that's all nations um, going up to learn God's ways. Um, they're, they're forgetting about war. They're putting their resources, instead of into um, fighting and conflict, into producing food for, for, to, to, to feed each other, to feed the nations. That is world peace. They, neither shall they learn war anymore. That, this is the vision that the Bible um, is setting out for us. I'd like us to turn, while we're in Isaiah, just to go to chapter 35 as well. Um, this isn't so much talking about war, um, but it's more describing the the time when this um, when this kingdom will be set up, uh, when people turn away from from, from war, and um, this future king um, is ruling from Israel. It says there in verse five, the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped, the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. So this is talking about a time when all the um, the ailments that we have um, will be reduced and taken away because we've got um, we've, we're living in a, a much better world. For water shall burst forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of jackals where each lay. So. There's, there's, there's a lovely um, picture again, isn't it, of, of, of this time of peace and, and um, good health for the world. Um, we'll also go to Psalm 72, which again talks of this, this time. So Psalm 72. So Psalm 72, we've got this, we've got the idea of a king here, haven't we? So Psalm 72 in verse 1. Give the king your judgments, O God, and your righteousness to the king's son. He will judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. The mountains shall bring peace to the people. That's a little bit, there's a bit of an echo there of what we heard in Isaiah. The mountains bringing peace to the people. And the, the little hills by righteousness... He will bring justice to the poor of the people. He will save the children of the needy and will break in pieces the oppressor. So, Mr. Putin, you know, you're going to be removed, okay? All these oppressors, these sorts of people, they, they will be broken in pieces because there's going to be a time when the, the, the poor, the people who are being oppressed, that's, that's going to change. Um, we'll just jump on to verse 12 where we read, he will deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also. So poverty will be a thing of the past, and him who has no helper. He will, share, he will spare the poor and the needy, and will save the souls of the needy. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence, and precious shall be their blood in his sight. And a time when, say, food will, will, will abound. Uh, verse 16, there will be an abundance of grain in the earth. On the top of the mountains, it's... Fruit shall wave like Lebanon, and those of the city shall flourish like the grass of the earth. So it's a, it's a vision of, 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 of um, no more poverty, of plenty, and the oppressor um, broken in pieces. And isn't this the kind of world we'd like to see? It's certainly the kind of world I'd like to see. So how does this happen? Who is this king? Well, at this time of year, we quite often hear these words don't we whoops there we go um they're the words that were spoken to mary uh, the mother of jesus and this was at the time when um before she she was about to conceive um and and, and bear a child and being 
a young virgin who was about to get married, she was very troubled when she heard this message. So we read these words, and they're words that, we, that are very well known to us, especially at this time of year. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Jesus means saviour. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. So he's going to be a king. He's going to sit on a throne. Well, where was this throne? Well, he says there, if we read on, he says he will reign over the house of Jacob. Jacob was the name. Jacob's, Jacob was one of the patriarchs of uh, <coughs> the people of Israel. And his name was changed to Israel. So that's where we get the name Israel from. So this, this throne this is going to be in Israel. David was one of the great kings of Israel. And um, due to the um, misdemeanours, if you like, the faithlessness of the, of the kings that came after David, that throne, uh, the last king to sit on that throne was removed. And it was said that there would, there would be no more kings until the one should come whose right it is to sit on that throne. And he's telling us there that, that, that the person who is going to sit on that throne is Jesus. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. So this, it's, that kingdom is Jerusalem, isn't it? And this is the king. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're being told here. So that's the throne of his father David, and it's in Jerusalem. So we've still got to... You know, we've still got to get away, haven't we, to um, how Jesus is going to do this. Um, just thinking about, you know, conflict and, and, and all those sorts of things. I just want to read a little extract from a book that I've been reading recently. Um, and, uh, well, it's called Landlines. It's one of a series of books by somebody called Rainer Wynne, who goes on very big walks. Um, but... Um, Anyway, at this point, uh, her and her husband are on, on bicycles rather than uh, walking. Um, and they've come, they're walking through Scotland and uh, they come to a place called Flodden Field. And, um, and uh, she talks about uh, the skirmishes that occurred because it was on a border um, between England and, and, and Scotland. And she goes on to say that... Uh, but what came to these fields in 1513 was so much more than a skirmish. The battle between the Scots and the English left James IV of Scotland and between 10 and 20,000 soldiers dead in the mud of those border farmlands. Such a momentous and horrendous battle now marked only by a stone cross and a tiny car park. We unlock the bikes and cycle away, the weight of the death of thousands hanging heavily over us. Since the 16th century, humans have changed the world beyond recognition. We've revolutionised the way we live, made breathtaking and miraculous discoveries, and yet we seem totally incapable of changing ourselves. We haven't evolved a step beyond that day in 1513, which saw so many people die. Centuries in which we could have worked together to find a way of life where no one is hungry or without shelter, a world where we don't destroy the climate. But instead, all we've done is waste precious time fighting over a line on a map. I cycle on, imagining a world without borders. Now, that's, that's somebody who doesn't believe in God. I mean, she's not religious, as far as I know. Um, but it's making it, you know, sometimes we say, well, you know, people are generally good. And, 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 we, and we do see a lot of good in people, don't we? But, you know, we are in a situation where there are wars and conflicts going on. And so it, it needs to be changed, doesn't it? And these wars and conflicts are, are caused by several things, aren't they, when you think about it? It's greed, isn't it? Those armies um, fighting over, over land and, and borders. Um, it's envy, you know, we want what other people have. It's pride, you know, we won't back down in an argument. It's hatred, it's jealousy, vengeance. Um, we could sum it up as human nature. And it's what the Bible calls sin. And so we have to look at what is God's ways and, and, and what are man's ways. Because peace will be established when 
people follow God's ways rather than the sinful ways of human nature. Um, if you'd like to turn with me to Galatians and chapter 5, we have a good summary of, um, of human nature and, and what are God's ways and what are man's ways. So um, Galatians chapter 5. So Galatians chapter 5, um, I'll get to myself in a minute, okay, so in Galatians chapter 5 in verse 19 we read these words, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so if we're honest and we, we look at you know, the, the conflicts that are going on in the world, these are all the th sorts of things that are causing them. But he, then he goes on to describe something better, the fruit of the Spirit. And these are God's ways. So the fruit of the Spirit is... Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh, those things that we talked about before, with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So that's how we get the end to, to conflict. That's how it is established, isn't it? So there's a slide there which kind of sums up what we've just, what we've just read, isn't it? In a sort of pictorial way, um, these things. And Jesus himself, um, he went on to teach us uh, all, all, all this when he was here. Um, in Matthew chapter 5, we have the Sermon on the Mount and he taught the Beatitudes um, where he's, he's up on that mountain he opens his mouth and teaches them, blessed, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of, the God, of God. And then he tells them something even harder, really. Very hard saying. He says, look, you've heard that it was said you shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. And, you know, that's fair enough, isn't it? Most people can cope with that. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. So that's quite a hard saying, isn't it? You know, and, and, and Jesus, that's what Jesus is expecting us to try and do now. So we have to, we're sort of starting the, the work of preparing for the kingdom now in trying to love our enemies uh, and pray for our enemies, you know. And, and, that, and that's, that's not an easy thing, is it? But that's a transformation that um, God is looking for in us, that we should um, change our lives to be more like um, him and like Christ. So Christ showed us the way to peace. Now, he knew that men would represent, misrepresent his message. And Jesus actually said... Don't think I've come to bring peace. I, I've actually come to bring a sword. And I believe that's because he knew what, what men are like. He knew that men would use this book to justify doing terrible things. But when we look at what his message is, is saying, you know, we're not going to do that, are we? If, we've, if, we're, if we're truly trying to follow his ways, we're praying for our enemies. We're not um, trying to uh, kill people. 
Um, so that's you know that that's what Jesus was trying to um, prove and, and to show us. And he showed this too at his crucifixion. If we go to um, John, uh, John's Gospel. Um, we're going to chapter 18. So these, this is just before he was, uh, well, while he was being arrested, before his crucifixion. Um, so if we go in at verse um, 7, we read there. And he asked them again, saying, Who, whom are you seeking? So this is as they come to arrest him. And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these, that's his disciples, go their way. He didn't want them to be harmed. They, they, these people had come to him with weapons to arrest him. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, so one of our sort of most um, famous, if you like, disciples, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. And the servant's name was Malchus. So Peter, so Jesus says to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which the Father has given me? So he tells Peter to put that sword away, doesn't he? And Peter was having a good go, wasn't he? I mean, you know, if you get his ear, you know where he's aiming. Don't you? I don't think he was just uh, just pop his ear off. He was he was aiming for the for the head because he was trying, wanting to save Jesus from this arrest. But Jesus knew that he had to go through with it. And and uh, other of the gospels describe how he actually heals the, the that servant's ear and makes him whole again, which Jesus had the had the power to do. So that was that was Jesus in the resisting not resisting his arrest. Um, and then if we come to verse thirty three, we as he as he is taken to Pilate, um, the Roman uh, governor at the time, he enters the Praetorium again. And they called Jesus and he said to them, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this, me, or about, to, for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. So Jesus knew that he was going to be a king because Pilate goes on. He says, are you then a king? Jesus said, you say rightly that I am a king. And for this cause I was born. And for this cause I've come into the world that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So he talks of, of, of being a king and he, and he says, I'm not going to resist you now. You know, you've got the power. You're, you're, you're this Roman governor. I'm not going to resist your power. But he does indicate, doesn't he, that there's going to come a time in the future when he will establish his kingdom. And he says, then my servants would fight. So there would, there would come a time in the future, he says, when his kingdom will, um, he will use force, um, but not at this stage. And if you come to Psalm 2, you can read about how Jesus does have to use force to establish his kingdom. Because the Putins of this world and um, such like, um, you know, the president of China... Um, all these sorts of people they, they, they don't they're not going to just bow down and they don't want to you know lose their big positions of power to Jesus or anybody else um, when he comes to set up that kingdom and we read about how he deals with this situation so verse 1 it says why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together so there's like a you know, a, a whole group of them who think, right, we're, we're not having this. So they group together against the Lord and against his anointed. Anointed means, is, is, that word is Christ. So that's what it means there. Saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords away from us. But he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. 
the Lord shall hold them in derision. And then he shall speak to them in his wrath and, dis and distress them with his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So Jesus is going to be on that king, on that, sorry, he's going to be king on that hill. He's not going to back down to these uh, dictators because they're not, they're not making the world a nice place. Jesus is going to make it a nice place. I will decree the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son today, have I begotten you? So that's the Lord Jesus, isn't it? He's been begotten by God. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, kings, <laughs> be wise. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve for the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in, his, in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. But blessed, it says, happy are those who put their trust in him. So, you know, these, this sort of rebellion will be quelled and that's, that kingdom will be established. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not straightforward. Is it? People don't just uh, don't want to lose their, their power, but, but they, they, they will because world peace is a certainty. Jesus will certainly set up that kingdom. And it will be a, a, a place of justice. We're not going to have the situation where the poor are oppressed anymore. Um, this is a quotation from Psalm 67, where we have Jesus described as a righteous judge. He says there, his delight is in the fear of the Lord. And he will not judge by the sight of his eyes. So it's not just what he sees or what he hears, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide the equity with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist. He, when he uh, was here on the earth um, 2,000 years ago, met, often he knew the thoughts of people um, before, that they didn't have to speak, he knew what was going on in their hearts and their minds. And that's how Jesus can be that righteous judge, that he can judge the earth. So we're looking forward to a wonderful time. And we're able to share in that hope, um, in, that, in that kingdom. And what Jesus did in uh, dying and, and being raised again from the dead was opened up the way to eternal life for believers. Eternal life in that kingdom where we can be with him, where we can rule with him. And... Um, if you'd just like to turn with me to Corinthians chapter 15. This is our final um, chapter we're looking at this evening. We read there of this, uh, this, this hope, really, that, that Jesus brings us, the hope of our everlasting life in that kingdom. So verse 20, we read, But now G Christ is risen from the dead. So Jesus was risen from the dead. He didn't stay in the tomb, he, he, he came out, he rose from the dead, and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep or, or those who have died. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. So that's Christ, isn't it? As in all Adam, all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but each one in his order. And then verse 24, it says, Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father. When he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign, he will reign, till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death, for he has put all things under his feet. And that's a wonderful prospect that death won't be a, an issue for us anymore um, when Jesus um, establishes that kingdom and, 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 and at the end of that period puts um, death to death, if you like, it, it, it is over. Um, we read of this final victory in verse 50. Now this, I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep or die, but we shall all be changed. So if the Lord Jesus returns, we and we, and we are deemed to be faithful, if we put our faith in him, um, we won't necessarily die. We could be 
changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it says there, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound that the dead will be raised incorruptible. So those that we've loved and lost will be raised and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And isn't that wonderful? And then there's those words in uh, verse um, 55. Um, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? So um, what a victory the Lord Jesus will bring about. So he will establish world peace. It is to be a certainty. And we have a lovely vision. Uh, we thought about this this morning, those of us who were here. Um, the new heavens, the new earth that God will create. A time of, um, of real peace. And verse 4 tells us there, doesn't it, that uh, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. So what a, what a vision we have, and what a hope. And I believe that world peace is a certainty. So thanks for listening.